How many of you, if you're trying to decide which cybersecurity solution you want to implement, you're thinking, you're deciding, should it be Cisco, should it be Checkpoint? How many of you would go into Google, look up the local psychic, and consult with her? Anybody? Yes? OK. No, there are some, 1% of you. OK. Now, what if I told you my friend Dan, he knows this incredible psychic, the amazing Zelda. And he called her, and she told him, go with the Checkpoint solution. Go with the firewall. That was in September. Four weeks later, he still hasn't had a breach. She's amazing. So if you know that, and I say you should use her, she's got a track record, then who would feel confident in doing that? Take my money. <laughs> Take my money. OK, so now this might sound like a silly question, but seriously, this is my life, OK? Working in data science, um, when people find out what we do, we work in predictive analytics, et cetera, I get, oh, so you guys are like Cambridge Analytica, right? Um, now, we as a serious science company, I employ PhDs in physics, masters in machine learning. No, we're not like the guy at Cambridge Analytica, the high school dropout, the pink hair, who claims that he got Brexit and he did the Trump election and all of those things. No, we are not like that. Um, and and uh, so I wanted to talk to you today. Mike asked me to, um, to speak today on the topic of Cambridge Analytica because I know and he knows that a lot of you in your jobs, not, not just as in cybersecurity but as chief information officers, et cetera, are asked to look at solutions and things that might violate privacy or privacy protocols, the laws of the country. And, um, and so I wanted to talk to you a little bit today not just about privacy, but about junk science, if you will. Because I think a lot of the time when we look at the, um, the stories and the coverage of Cambridge Analytica, it was all about whether or not they had violated privacy and hardly anything on whether or not they were actually responsible for the things that they claimed to be responsible for. And if you look at the science and you look at how they work, you will see that nothing that they did, no methodology that they followed, could have possibly been responsible for the things they claimed to be. They are essentially charlatans. Um, and I think it's important to point that out because if we believe that we have to violate our client's privacy in order to get results for the marketing team, then you're much more likely to, to breach privacy and to break the law. But if you know that it's not going to work anyway and that you can get the marketing team the results that they want be accurate and you don't have to violate in any privacy, in fact you'll do better if you don't, then you're not tempted to do those things. So I wanted to look a little bit at the science, um, what we know and to, to work and not work in data science, um, talk a little bit about privacy laws and how they're likely to evolve in this space in Canada. Um, just so you know, nothing that Cambridge Analytica did was illegal in Canada. In fact, IRAP funded their, their company out in Vancouver. Um, they, they did not violate any Canadian privacy laws. Um, they did violate European privacy laws, but they weren't operating in Europe. So none of what they did actually violates Canadian privacy law yet. But I wouldn't go out and buy systems like that or buy similar companies because probably those laws are going to change in the wake of that. Um, and public outcry, and so it's not something you want to invest in uh, necessarily. But how do we know that it, that it didn't work? Um, Cambridge Analytica, what they did was they sent out surveys to people, and based on those surveys, they created profiles of what people were like, and they had one of five categories. It's the ocean, the ocean psychographic profiles, right? Open, conscientious, agreeable, neurotic. Now, this is not new. Uh, they claimed that this was something they invented. They didn't. I remember seeing the ocean psychographics when I worked in advertising 10 years ago up on the wall in the boardroom. It's not new. And you cannot use it to predict how somebody is going to vote. Um, why not? Um, well, I'm feeling neurotic right now, right? Because I'm standing up in a podium and I'm speaking. But I'm not neurotic all the time, okay? At least I don't think so. Maybe my 
my coworkers think so, but I'm not neurotic all the time. I'm just neurotic now. Um, if you ask me who I'm going to vote for now, I might say Donald Trump, because frankly, when I'm up and I'm speaking, he makes me feel good about myself, right? Um, <clears throat> but after a nice glass of scotch tonight and I'm relaxing, I'm going to feel more open and more agreeable, I'm going to change my opinion. The lesson is you cannot, first of all, people's uh, personalities change throughout the day. They change the context that they're in. That's why I was, there's, there's all sorts of, you know, I get asked, asked all sorts of questions or this, this technology where you strap this thing onto your brain and it measure, your, measures your brain waves while you're shopping for shoes and it says, okay, you're this type of shopper. Well, that's if I'm shopping with, for shoes of my own. If I'm shopping for shoes with a toddler, I have a totally different personality, right? So are you going to be measuring me all the time? It costs $50,000 to wear one of these things. It's silly. People's personalities change throughout the day, they change throughout time, um, and even if somebody stayed the same way all the time, they were always agreeable, or they were always neurotic, you still can't use that label to say how somebody is going to vote. You also can't change somebody's vote. Now think, think about, you can't get people to do things that they don't believe in. So, for example, um, Look at the, the, um, the campaign to stop people from drinking and driving. How long did it take the government with those ads before we actually started to see a reduction in drinking and driving in actual fact on the streets? Anybody want to hazard a guess? Yeah, oh, it took 20 years. It took an entire generation of advertising to do something that makes logical sense. It was similar to quitting smoking. It took an entire generation. It took kids seeing their parents and grandparents dying from the effects of lung cancer. It took a lot, a lot, a lot of PR work. So to say that you're going to change somebody's vote in a 30-day campaign is pretty crazy. And frankly, I actually think people are just using Cambridge Analytica as an excuse because Americans don't want to admit that they voted for Donald Trump, and they did. He won fair and square. It's not because of ads that people saw from Cambridge Analytica. Um, so, <clears throat> what Cambridge Analytica did with the business they were in was micro-targeting. And as a CIO or somebody who works in information technology, you will often be asked um, from people in the marketing group or people in your business team, we've got this new fandangled solution, it does micro-targeting, it's an app, it's going to follow Mike everywhere he goes. It's going to record everybody he dates, what he eats for supper, what he has for lunch, what he's doing. And based on that, we can figure out that he's going to buy grapes at 2 o'clock on Tuesday at the Metro. Okay? You know right away that this is, this is not, it's not possible to track what an individual is going to do, even if you have reams and reams and reams of information on that person. Think about your own life. How many times this week did your plans, whatever they were, get derailed, right? You might have had plans to do something, the kid is sick, your wife falls down the stairs, you're going to meet with a coworker, he or she cancels, your plans are derailed. So even you can't figure out what you are going to do tomorrow or this weekend. You might have plans, but those plans will change. So for me to try and figure out, because I work in data science and I have lots of data on you, what you're going to do this weekend, I'm going to have a very, very high margin of error. Now, I might be right about one or two of you, but if I said, everybody in this room, I've got enough data, I'm gonna figure out what all of you are doing two o'clock on Saturday, you should know right then and there, that's a snake oil salesman, because nobody can do that. Um, what we can do is what actuaries have been doing for decades, in fact, is do population trend research. So, while the fortune teller probably only gets it right one or two percent of the time, and that's why she's living in a tent and, you know, scraping by, um, your insurance brokers are also in the prediction business. They're called actuaries, and they're not living in a tent, okay? They're living very well, and they're making billions of dollars in profits. Why? Because they might look at you and say, Ted, you look fantastic, your parents live to 100, you don't smoke, you don't drink, you're not neurotic, um, I'm going to give you a million dollar life insurance policy. And then you walk out of the office, you get hit by a car, he's just lost a million dollars. But that's okay, because he's got 100,000 more people like you. So he'll be wrong 5% of the time, but he'll be right 
95% of the time. And that kind of research works. And we know that. So if you're going to be doing market research or trend analysis, you've got to do it the way Stats Can does it, the way Health Canada does it, um, the way anybody who has ever had success in research does it. You're looking at the aggregate. You're looking at population level trends. Now that doesn't mean you can't see trends in demographics, that you can't see trends in psychographics. Absolutely you can. But the longer out you try to predict, the less accurate it will be. It's just like the weather. I can tell you later today it's probably going to be gray and damp. Um, if I try to tell you what the weather is going to be like in January, aside from cold, um, I'm less likely to be accurate. Okay? So, uh, and that's because people change, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what I'm going to buy depends on somebody's birthday it is or what have you. Things just change. So, uh, number one, population level statistics, very accurate. Micro-targeting, very inaccurate. What does that mean for privacy? Is there any value in having reams and reams and reams of data about Mike Zeus? Or am I better off having reams of data about 100,000 people like Mike and trying to see trends? Avocados trending, the keto diet is trending, or it's not trending. Um, I think you know, as people who have a science-based background, the population level research is going to be a lot more accurate. Uh, We've been doing micro-targeting for a while, loyalty programs. What are, what are companies doing now? They're getting out of the loyalty programs. Why? Because they're very expensive to run. They're 2 to 3% of revenue, top-line revenue, and they're not giving you, they're not improving, they're improving sales in the sense that people come back to you, which is cool, but you can do that with better marketing, better pricing, being more competitive, having a better product, which is the better way to compete rather than bribing people to buy your product. From a data point of view, loyalty programs go out of date very, very quickly. We get a lot of customers who say, can we give you our loyalty program inf information? We say, well, is it more than six months old? Yeah. Then no. No, thank you. Anything more than six months old. We were the official pollster for the Ontario election. Uh, 124 ridings. We got 118 bang on. Of the ones we didn't get right, um, five of them were within a, a, a thousand votes. So there were only two that we really didn't get bang on. So we're able to do that with population level research. We now have people coming up to us saying, can I use that AI that you used for the Ontario election? It's out of date. So we have to start it all over again. And the Ontario election was in June. Okay? So data, like I said, if you're trying to forecast too far out, you will be inaccurate. If you've got data in your system that is a year old, that is six months old, forget it. We can get much, much more accurate data just going online and doing proper sampling of the population. Um, <clears throat> what about apps that, that, um, that do loyalty and track you obsessively and all that? Again, very expensive. Um, let's say you're working for the LCBO and you've got an app and you know that Mike likes to drink Malbec and every time he drives by, sorry I'm picking on you because you're the only person whose name I know, um, every time he drives by the LCBO he gets a pop-up thing for a Malbec, but now Mike's dating somebody who doesn't drink, he's moved off from the Malbec, or maybe he's moved away from here altogether, so he's now living in Kappa's casing and you don't know what he's drinking over there. Um, you get the picture people change. Not only that, but Mike is going to get sick of the pop-ups. We know this too. Apps that do these types of things last on average 30 days before people take them off their phone, take them off their system. They get tired of it. They get tired of being messaged to. So we do know, science does show us that micro-targeting works in the short term. You will see short-term results. That's what hooks you in. It's kind of like when you go gambling, you go to the casino Lac Lemi and you win a few times and then now you're there all night because you got, you got hooked. Micro-targeting will hook you that way, but it doesn't work in the long term, and it's not good science. So, what does that mean from a policy perspective? Um, we've been lobbying really hard, and we are, you know, an AI company that works in human behavior research. We have had the tires kicked on us, thankfully, at Parliament Hill by the Privacy Commissioner. We do work with Health Canada. We do a lot of work, so there is no privacy violation. And yet, it is extremely accurate. Um, like I said, Ontario election, 118 out of 124 ridings, no political pundit got that close. Um, and that was with no human intervention, just the AI predicting the election. How does she do it? Getting representative samples of people on social media, 
You get all sorts of questions about that. Isn't social media biased? That's why you get representative samples. But population level research where we're not capturing names, we're not capturing any personal, personally identifiable information, we can still get extremely, extremely accurate information um, from a, from our, for our customers and from a policy perspective. So we are big fans, not wholesale, of the GDPR implementation in Europe. There are some issues with it, and we're working with government here to make sure we don't make the same mistakes that were made in that legislation. But definitely um, uh, very big advocates for protecting personal information, not just because it's the right thing to do from a policy perspective and from a privacy perspective and for your brand, but because it's actually going to get you better results from a business perspective. Um, <clears throat> We'll have a lot of customers who say, will you show us your algorithm? Because other companies won't show us their algorithm. That's probably because they don't have one. Um, but absolutely, we do publish our algorithm. There is no black box. Um, we don't believe in that. We think that companies who are working in this space should publish their algorithms, should make it clear what they're doing to eliminate bias um, in training, because we get that a lot as well. How do I know that the results aren't biased? Because we've all heard about the the recidivism AI that, you know, is locking up visible minorities all the time and things like that. So yes, we have to be open about that, about the algorithms that we use. Um, there are no black boxes. And if you're ever working with companies in this space, it is absolutely crucial that you get to look under those covers because otherwise, how do you know, A, that this is real science and, and B, that what they are giving you is going to be unbiased and accurate. <clears throat> Most importantly, um, it's important to be able to distinguish between a methodology and a tool. So we get all the time, oh, we have social media listening. We're using Radian 6, we're using Sysimos, we're using all these things. Those are tools. Um, each time that you run them, you will get a different result. Why? Because they're using reservoir sampling. So it takes in the first 50,000 posts, analyzes that. But there are trillions of posts on any given topic. They're doing keyword searches. They're not doing it. They're not looking at representative random samples of the population. So of course, you know, if you're doing a keyword search, you're getting a biased result because you're only looking for people speaking on that topic. What you want to be able to do is pull up, you want to do a people search, not a keyword search, get a representative sample and say how many people are talking about this topic and what are they saying. Um, you'll get radically different results when you do the keyword. It will be different every time. And that's why when you, when you see in the paper, they'll say this survey is right within 1.2 percentage points, 19 times out of 20. What they mean is if you were to give this methodology to 20 different scientists and they were all to run it, they would get the exact 19 of them would get the exact same results. That is science-based research when it's repeatable. If you were to do the same thing with some of these tools, 20 people will go out and do it, 19 of them would have radically different results. That is not a science-based research study. So these are the types of things that you can, that you can do to uh, ensure that you're getting real science in your data research, that uh, you are not violating privacy, that you're not subject to, to bias. And, um, and that's about it. I didn't want to make it too long during lunch hour. I wanted to leave things open for, for questions. Um, yes, we are doing the midterm elections, if anybody has questions about that in the U.S. Um, but are there any questions that people have? Because I wanted to uh, get into questions pretty quickly so that we get engaged. Yep. Yeah, so, the, um, I, so let me see if I got your question right. So trying to predict how each person will vote is impossible. Um, but could I, if I figured out the demographics and the personalities of the people in the room, influence them to vote a different way? if I had enough time. So now, it's important to understand what I would not be doing is uh, selling, selling skis to people who live in the desert, OK? So it's, it's really uh, almost impossible to get people to do things that they wouldn't otherwise do or that they don't believe in. It takes a long time to change public opinion normally. Um, but what we can do, so in the work that we've done, we've seen that it's probably about 1% of any kind of advertising or work that you put out there will actually move the needle. We are able to see what that 1% is, and it doesn't have to be digital. We can look at speeches, we could look at television ads, we can look at bus ads, 
and we can see what's working and what isn't working so that we can concentrate on those things that are working. Now, we did do some work for a company in the United States last year. Uh, they had a, a chemical mostly used in farms, but the protest was coming from people who were using it on their lawns, and there was concern that the, that the chemical could have adverse health effects, uh, specifically on children and, and uh, pets. Now, the research, most of the research, showed that it didn't. There was one bit of research that showed that it could. So it was going up in front of the EPA um, to, be, to be voted on. Uh, two things that were interesting. Number one, when something goes in front of the EPA in the United States, the cases that are going up, unlike in Environment Canada where we have a hearing, it's closed. There, everything is open. It's up on the website. We're going to be looking at this chemical and whatever. And then all, these, all the groups like Greenpeace and the World Wildlife Fund and whatever can then come and launch a campaign against this, this chemical. So they hired us to say, how many protests are we going to get when we go in front of the EPA? We told them, and because we don't ask any questions or anything, right? We're, we're gleaning all this information quietly. We told them you won't get any, between zero and 2,000, because there's always a, an interval. And the, the person who had hired us said, well, that's just ridiculous. Like you said, I, I was into this AI thing, but now I totally don't believe in it because, uh, you know, he said, you have to realize here in the U.S., there are people who their full-time job is to protest, so they're definitely going to be protesting. The lowest number of calls we've ever had when we've gone in front of the EPA is 350,000. So we had our tail between our legs. We walked out, very embarrassed. To this day, that was last year, they haven't had a single call. Okay, so the AI was bang on. So they hired us back. Now there was legislation to ban the chemical, and they wanted to know, and at the time that this legislation was coming through, 56% of the population was against the chemical. So they were going to lose in public opinion. They hired us, and we did what's called message testing to figure out. Now, this is not brainwashing people. It's important to understand the distinction. It's not convince, you know, lying to people or convincing them of things that aren't true. It's saying, here are, we've only got one kick at the can here. There's lots we could say. We could say, oh, look, there have been 1,200 studies, and you know, only one of them said it was bad. Uh, there could be messaging that says, look, if we get rid of this chemical, farmers aren't going to be able to make food, and the price of food, well, I mean, they will be able to make food, but the price of food is going to skyrocket. It's going to affect your pocketbook. So there are all sorts of different messages. They like the farmer one. We said, no, go with the studies. There have been lots of studies, and they show this. They went, and we showed, we were able to show them, if you did the farmer message, it won't change public opinion at all. But if you do this other one, it will. And they did the other one, it changed public opinion and the legislation didn't pass. So it's a long way of answering your question because these things are complicated, uh, but I want to make it clear that we're not, we're not trying to convince people to do things they don't believe in. We're making sure that people get the information that is relevant to them. They want to know how many studies have been done and what, is, what has been the research on it. When they're worried about your health, you're less concerned about the price of corn, right? Once you've got your health squared away, then, then you have time to worry about the price of corn. So, um, so that's what the research showed, and it worked very effectively. So all that to say, you can use this. That's a branch of science called prescriptive analytics. It's where you're changing behavior. You're changing people's minds. It's very difficult to do. It's a nascent science. Uh, prediction is much easier. Prescriptive is much easier harder, and it typically takes quite a bit of time, like a year. Um, in a 30-day election campaign, when things are happening all the time, there's scandals, there's this, there's that, one thing we did find very clearly in the Ontario election and other elections we've had, we're, by the way, the only uh, company in this country that got Brexit right at 52%, plus or minus 1.2, one of only 16 companies in the world to get that right. So prediction is still hard. Um, one of the things we notice is that scandals don't affect public opinion the way politicians think they do. So we were looking at it um, for the, the Ontario election that just passed, and I was on TVO because I was giving regular commentary, and then they had the political pundits who, told, who were telling us that these scandals are really having a big effect, and I was the lone wolf saying, no, no, we've, we're looking at them, we're looking at the stuffing the ballot boxes and, you know, this, that, and the other thing, and, Rob, uh, Doug Ford's widow, and, and it, it wasn't moving a needle. And one of the pundits said, you know, I think Aaron's just hearing all the liberals who are posting because the liberals have got a lot of people out posting. And I said, glad you brought that up. That's why we do representative sampling. We're able to tell the difference. 
those people aren't in our sample. Um, but all that to say the, the scandals were not affecting how people were going to vote. What was affecting, except for one scandal, which was um, the NDP, I thought it would be when the NDP got the budget off by a billion dollars. I thought that would hurt them because, you know, that kind of hurts the NDP where they're naturally hurting. But it didn't. When she apologized, everybody forgave Andrew Horvath for that. But the poppies, you know, when they said um, poppies were filling landfills or whatever, it was a slag at veterans. That did affect their vote. And the Hitler comment did affect their vote. But no other scandal in the election was effective. What was effective was the tariffs, um, Donald Trump, that really hurt Andrea Horvath because people thought, okay, well, Andrea Horvath's base, she came from Hamilton, right, so Steel Town, and, and also Sault Ste. Marie, where Algoma was headquartered. They just didn't see the NDP going up against Donald Trump. So that, that affected um, their popularity. So we are able to see in a very granular way what changes opinion. And, if, and we don't work for political parties, but if we did, we would have said, talk about those, those uh, steel tariffs. Don't bother with the sex scandals and all of that because it, it really doesn't change people's opinion at the end of the day. Yep, they can do that right now. So we're working with a number of elections bodies um, in other countries for that. So this is interesting. I gave a talk on this um, not too long ago uh, on the whole fake news thing. Um, and it was funny because it was the government of Canada and they were asking for people to come up with, you know, what are your solutions for how, how we deal with fake news, which we call manufactured news just because we don't want to use the same terminology uh, as, you know, the propaganda. Um, so manufactured news, um, how, do you, how do you detect it? Now the others all came up with, okay, well, we're going to look at the news, we're going to have text analytics, and we're going to say if they talk about hate and all that kind of stuff. And I got up and I said, okay, the last, okay, that makes us China, right? <laughs> like if we start going through the content of what people are putting out there and saying, no, that content, I don't like that content, take that off, that's hateful, um, you're getting yourself into a really precarious situation. So what we said is fake, or sorry, I'm saying it now, manufactured news or any kind of content that's put out by it, whether it's a state actor or any other kind of actor, moves through the network differently from credible news, okay? So if you come out with something that says, okay, Justin, Justin Trudeau's a pedophile, okay? Um, reasonable people are probably not gonna be circulating that to their friends and family, right? Um, and you, we get that all the time, where you get things that you know are obviously fake. You don't, you don't spread it around because you don't wanna look like that person. So, but there are certain pockets of the population that will circulate it, and bots will circulate it. So what we do is we take a representative sample of the population, say 300,000 Canadians, who we know are representative of the population, and there's all sorts of ways that we know that they're representative, but they are randomly chosen, and they, they have the whole, um, we, can, we can figure out a lot about the population by you know, using text analytics. And then we just take the fire hose from Twitter or from Facebook or what have you, we just take that fire hose, which is everything that goes through, or we do a reservoir sample, News that is manufactured will go through quickly uh, through the bots and through certain populations, maybe alt.right or whatever, we can create a sample of alt.right, and it'll move quickly through those populations. But in the quote-unquote average population, that story will not circulate at the same rate. And that's what we do. We say, this story is circulating in a manufactured way put it aside and let a human being look at it and make that judgment. Um, and we feel that's a much better way of, of handling that situation than trying to be the, uh, the, the police who, who decide whether or not something's worthy of being circulated. Um, and, we, and we do that also for uh, things where somebody's saying the polling station has changed, things like that. We can, we can uh, detect those things. When the shooting happened at Parliament Hill here in Ottawa, we were, we were getting accurate reports of what was happening before the police tweeted them out. We knew that uh, Stephen Harper was headed to Meech Lake because we were seeing the tweets. People saw him going by in the car. So all of those things, so from a security perspective, from a fraud perspective, um, is definitely things that we can do right now. We could also prove whether or not, by the way, Cambridge Analytica really was effective in moving the needle if they give the, the ads that they put out there 
Because everything on social media is still there, we can go back to 2012, get a representative sample. We can go back to the election, to Brexit, to Trump, and we can, and we can prove once and for all. But of course, they're not, they're not giving that, that content up. But we have put that challenge out to them. Yes? 24% of people will still vote for him, yes. So, so, um, it's really interesting. There, there's, uh, so the question was, Trump says he could shoot somebody in the middle of Times Square, and people will still vote for him. And yes, that is true. We, there are people who would still vote for him. He's got a good 24% of the base in the United States that, uh, that will vote for him. I don't know if he, sh maybe if he shot somebody in Times Square. Um, and... And you're not going to move that needle. And that's why we say to a lot of our customers, see these people over here? You're not changing that. It's the people in the middle or the people who are unsure. That's, that's, your, that's your target market. And that's why when, we're, when we say, yes, we can do prescriptive analytics, we can, we can definitely use marketing to, to change minds and stuff like that, there's some people whose minds you're never going to change. And interestingly, because of the way the boundaries are, are drawn in the United States right now, um, you know, the Democrats were looking at getting about a 24-seat majority in the midterms because the Democrats are going to come out in high numbers and the Trump supporters are not. But if all the Trump supporters came out and all the Democrats came out, or if voter turnout were what it normally is, that's why you see everybody in the states with the vote, vote. If voter turnout were to stay what it normally is, because Republicans are more likely to vote than Democrats, there would only be about an 11-seat difference, which is kind of astounding when you think of, you know, what's going on there. Um, and that's, that's, so with 24% of the vote, and there's you know, over 400 districts in the United States, with just 24% support, he could almost you know, come through and win a majority. But even, even with, with that, the, the Democrats are gonna win a majority this time, is what we're seeing. Question, and that, there was another question. Yep, you. Oh, yes, the midterm, yeah. So we are seeing a, a Democrat majority, like I said, about, by about 24 seats. There are still 80 districts that are very much in contention, so it could go either way. Um, but it looks like a Democrat majority. Yes? It's something about him. Um, we don't, we don't, normally actually a, a sitting president would have higher than 24%, actually. Like 24% is really low for somebody who's two years into his term. Um, we, we find it, it differs from leader to leader. Um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's interesting when we look at all of the issues in the United States, uh, Khashoggi, what have you, all the issues that are going on, the only one that's really moving the needle is the Brett Kavanaugh issue. Um, it's mobilizing uh, women in ways that are, you know, that it's actually mobilized people, that particular issue, but nothing else has. NAFTA hasn't. Um, it's interesting, too, that the jobs, even though unemployment's at 3.5%, one of the main things that's driving um, youth to the polls in the midterms, because they almost never vote in midterm elections, is jobs, because a lot of educated Americans feel, like young graduates feel that these jobs are not the kind of jobs they want. You know, they don't want to work in the coal mine. They don't want to work in the auto sector. If you're graduating with a degree in machine learning, is Trump doing the right thing for you? You know, they don't feel that he is. They feel the, it's not just having a job, it's having the right job. So there's definitely a big feeling of uh, that their skills are not going to be used and that America is not poised for the economy of the future. There's definitely a, a big current of Americans who feel that way, which is unusual and the unemployment rate is so low. <laughs> Usually people are just happy about that. Are there, yep. Uh, the biggest one we see is, oh sorry, the question was, uh, what mistakes do you see in the GDPR? Um, the biggest one for us is explainability. So from an AI perspective, I'm speaking here. So explainability is when you say, so for Brexit, for example, um, <coughs> we, we saw it was going to be a remain, remain until three days before the referendum. And then the AI toggled and said it's going to be exit. So, I mean, so we sent out a press release the morning of, before the polls opened in England, in Britain, 
and we said it's going to be an exit at 52%, plus or minus 1.2. Like I said, we were the only company in this country that said that. So, of course, everybody was booking me for interviews, right? Um, so I was going to be on CBC the next morning, and that night, at 10 o'clock at night, Nigel Farage, who was one of the leaders of the exit group, um, held a press conference and said, everybody go home. We have lost, even though the results weren't in yet. He said, my friends in the financial sector hired the best pollsters in the world, and they all say it's going to be Remain. And he was an exit guy. So, you know. So the producer at CBC texted me 10 o'clock at night and said, you're going to be on first thing tomorrow morning as the results are coming in, right? Like we were just going to be finding out at like 7 in the morning. And Nigel Farage has just conceded defeat. Do you want to change? your prediction, because he's feeling really sorry for me at this point, right? Because he said, you're going to be in with two others who say it's going to be Remain. So I call our chief scientist at home. Are you sure? Because I'm the one who's going to like, look like the idiot backpedaling for 15 minutes live on the air. And he, he ran it again. He said, I don't know what to tell you, Aaron. It says exit at 52%. So I texted uh, the producer back. His name is Howard Goldenthal. You can verify with him. And I said, we stand by our forecast. It's going to be an exit at 52%. And I didn't sleep all night. Now, and it was an exit when I came in. The other two, they told them, don't come in. You didn't get it right, the other two pollsters. So it was just me in the studio for 15 minutes needing to explain what happened in Britain, right? And so I sp spent the whole night trying to figure out why is the AI saying that? And that's why I say explainability is hard. We had to go through every hour for the last 72 hours leading up to the referendum to see at what point this thing toggled. So we can do explainability. We, we said to the AI, all right, you know, this event, that event, this event, that event, nothing's moving the needle. We, we can say to the AI, we can, unlike a human, you can't say to a human, well, pretend this event never happened. Now how do you feel? A person is not able, unless they're sociopathic or something, to divorce themselves from, from that. Uh, but an AI can. So you can say to an AI, pretend this never happened, now what is the result? And it can calculate that. So as we were going through all the events of the 72 hours leading up to Brexit, and this is how we know by the, another reason we know Cambridge Analytica did not influence this, unless they shot Joe Cox, um, is because we got up to the assassination of Joe Cox, and before she died, it was remain. And then we say, Joe Cox is dead, exit. Okay, now, so then you think, okay, the assassination of Joe Cox. But it wasn't the, and it, by the way, it wasn't like the minute she died. It was, okay, she died, the next day it still remained. Okay, so we're not thinking it's her assassination per se. What happened after her assassination? Um, David Cameron gave a speech to the nation. And while he was speaking, so we went through his speaking engagement, <laughs> um, his press conference, and we went through every line, da, 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 da. He gets to a point where he says, let's all observe silence in honor of Joe Cox. We're not going to campaign. We're not going to go door to door. Um, you know, we want you to just observe this moment of silence. Don't talk about it with your friends. And the AI said it was the silence that caused the exit. So why did the silence cause the exit? Well, okay, this, this is where it gets into explainability. But what the AI noticed was that if people came on with their friends and said, I'm, I'm thinking of voting exit, they would get pounced on. You're a xenophobe, you're anti-immigration, you're this, you're that. Um, and so they would clam up, they'd go quiet, and the AI noticed that when they came back, they tended to be reading the pro-exit stuff. They tended to be leaning more exit. So the AI rightly derived that once people went silent, they tend to toggle over to exit. They can't discuss their, their, their fears, so they take it out of the polls. Um, we were seeing that with Trump as well, by the way. Silence is not good. Keep, keep people talking. Well, unless you, you, know, you want your candidate to win, and then silence is good. But all that to say, that explainability took us a very long time. So your costs are going to go through the roof. There are better ways of making sure that your AI is not biased. Or, and the reason they want explainability is because of the whole you know, when they, they tried to use an AI for calculating recidivism rates and the AI was saying, oh, black people are going to, uh, you know, commit crimes again more than other people. That's a bias in us that's been reflected in the AI because of the way it was trained. It wasn't a properly trained AI. So what you want to do 
is make sure that your AI is properly trained. So all those training materials should be available because that will be a lot more cost effective and a lot more effective um, than, than doing explainability. You want to make sure that your algorithm is known and published. I kind of use the, the Phoenix example. You know, if I'd given you all the code for Phoenix ahead of time, would you have known it was going to screw up? No, you should have done pilots and case studies again. So there are ways of training it um, without being overly burdensome. And we think explainability is the wrong way to go because sometimes you just won't be able to explain it. But what you will be able to do is um, control the training and, uh, and look at the algorithm. Yes? Uh, what kind of controls do I have to what? Hold on, I'm just going to give you the microphone. Sorry, I was just having trouble hearing it. <laughs> Turn it on, maybe. Yeah. Do you want? Hello. OK, good. So, uh, since you seem to have a lot of influence, <laughs> and your data seems to be very good in some ways, how do you deal with potential data poisoning from the internal? Like, what kind of controls do you have to ensure that, you know, although your data from the outside may be controlled, mm -hmm. how about internally? How are you ensuring that it's not being yeah, like used to use your influence? Like, whether or not our, our uh, staff are poisoning the data? Staff. Staff or? somebody potentially breaching your systems to be able yeah. to use that? OK, yes. It's, that's an excellent question. because, and that's, So I'll answer the first one first with staff. It is, it is, so an, an AI is an intelligence. And like any intelligence, you know, it's not, people ask me a lot of time, what's the difference between analytics and AI? And AI learns. It learns. We call it alien intelligence, actually, at the office instead of artificial. because. It is an intelligence, and you can bias it. So one of the things we don't allow right now are customers to train their own AIs, um, because you really, really need to know what you're doing. Even our own staff do make mistakes, and we have ways of testing um, to see whether or not they've made, they make mistakes, because, and we have found that they do. Um, you, and, and they're highly trained, and they do this every day, and they still make mistakes, and the, and the AI comes out biased. I'll give you an example, just a simple example, a statistical example, because this is all statistics. In countries, like in our country, in our judicial system, we have a, <clears throat> uh, we have a policy, if you will, uh, when you're up for trial, that you are innocent until proven guilty. There are other countries where you are guilty until proven innocent, and in countries where the hypothesis is guilty until proven innocent, the conviction rate is actually quite a bit higher, statistically significant. So whatever hypothesis you give the AI, so we had an example where we were doing some work for a municipality and they wanted to know, are people worried about crime? Um, the researcher mistakenly put in, crime is a problem. Well, that's not what you say to an AI, because now the AI makes the assumption crime is a problem and needs to find evidence that it's not a problem. So it's biased in, f in favor of crime is a problem. So we had to fix it and say, just crime. Now, it turned out, too, that they thought city council were the criminals, <laughs> literally. Um, so, <laughs> so we had to be more precise. What do we mean by crime? Because obviously council didn't want that kind. Um, so. Um, so, you know, you have to be very precise, and it's, it's very hard to do. So that's why we don't let our, allow our customers to do it. Now, that's going to change, because obviously that puts a human in the loop. We are creating an AI that trains the AI, again, to keep it very, very kind of professional. And when that happens, there will be a lot more precision um, in doing it. And plus, we'll be able to work much more quickly after that. Um, the second question about breaches, um, the, the beauty of it is, because Facebook is paying for all the storage and Twitter and Instagram and all those guys, we don't collect any data. What we do is we collect results. So we'll crawl through and people will say, you know, that, you know, what I say to people is we, we can't see anything that other people can't see. We don't breach any privacy. If you got your privacy turned on, you'd be surprised how many people don't have the privacy turned on the way they do, think, think they do, but anyway. Um, 
you know, we're not, we're not breaching any privacy. And what we look at is we know what we're looking for and we just, it's ticking boxes. So if you were to break into our network, there are no names. We're not going to pay to store all these tweets and all these messages. What we're looking for is voting this way or not voting this way or uh, figuring out the information so that we come up with a game plan, um, what people are feeling, what's motivating them. That's what we're capturing, but it's not tied to information, it's tied to demographics. So 40-year-old men feel this way, or what have you. Need the microphone. Okay. Oh, no, you're good now. Yeah, no, that's a, um, that's a great question. I'd say that's a concern. So for example, with, um, we had it just now, we, we sent out a press release this morning on the midterm elections, and we had to be very careful. We were the official pollster for TVO, and we had, our AI was able to determine if Andrea Horvath can get these writings, she can win the election. She has to get those writings. It was like a path to victory. And if she didn't get them, and that was how we could tell early in the night that she you know, wasn't gonna win. Um, but uh, we were very careful, but it's, it's, it's an internal decision that we make um, that we did not reveal those writings on the air. We revealed one just to kind of illustrate it. And, Funny enough, we then tracked it. So we, we did reveal one of the writings and people in that, like the parties descended on that writing and changed it, changed the outcome. So it, it definitely can happen. And so we are very, and you know, do are people influenced by polls? Yes, they are. We can prove that absolutely. So when, you know, there is the, that, you know, there, there have been questions about that before, you know, because the political parties hire their own pollsters and then they'll put out a poll and say, oh, the liberals are winning or what have you. That does influence people. So that's true not only, you know, for an AI company, it's true for any company in advertising, what have you, is the news influencing or is the poll that you're releasing, what have you, influencing public opinion. And we know that it does. And it's not good for us because if we say, you know, they're going to win by 24 seats and, and here are the 80 districts where it's contentious, then those people, okay, I better get out and vote now because I'm in one of those 80 districts. You change the outcome and then my forecast looks wrong, right? So it, um, so, but we are conscious of that and, um, and it, it is a risk. That's all I, I can say. It's a risk for everybody that we do influence public opinion with this information. Well, thank you very much, Aaron.